You are listening to the Digital Parent Podcast with your host, Sed Lewis. Hey, peers, welcome to another episode of the Digital Parent Podcast. On today's episode, it's all about peace of mind. How many times have we hired a babysitter and we don't know what happens once we go out to dinner with our wife? And, you know, we don't know what's going on with the kids. We just taking the nanny's word for it. Or how many times our kids are coming home from school, they tell us they're completing their homework, and next thing we know, they're down the street. Or how many times we gave our 15-year-old the keys to the car, our 17-year-old the keys to the car, and they're speeding and they're getting speed tickets. Well, today's show is about giving you a peace of mind, and we're going to discuss surveillance equipment on this show, and we have the nation's best security expert, Todd Morris, with his number one company, Breakout Security, and they specialize in nanny cameras, hidden cameras, GPS trackers, and Todd came to the show and gave us a lot of expert tips on how to pick the right cameras to provide safety for our children and also how to save some money on insurance premiums when it comes to GPS and also how to audit our babysitters to making sure they're not wasting our money as well. So I hope you really like this show. But before we get into it, quick word from our sponsor, M-Spy. Parents, M-Spy is the ultimate monitoring tool for all devices. M-Spy remotely tracks GPS locations, calls, text, messages, WhatsApp, Snapchat, web browsers, pictures, and much more. With Inspire, you can also restrict unwanted calls, block websites, or even block apps. Go to mspy.com for more information. Hey, Todd, welcome to the Digital Parent Podcast. We're so happy to have you on today's show to talk about brick house security and all of the excellent products that you guys have for families and parents in particular. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Todd, for some of the parents who may not know about BrickHouse, kind of give us what is BrickHouse Security and why you guys are like the number one seller out there of, you know, resources or seller resources for nanny cams, GPS trackers, surveillance equipment, those types of products. So I started BrickHouse Security back in 2004, and the premise was really around providing technology for parents to keep track of their children in this modern age where very often technology is much more prevalent than it was when we were growing up and parents have a lifestyle that is sometimes more complicated and busy than our parents had when we were growing up in that both parents are very often working full time. So we really started off with um, child locators, nanny cameras, baby monitors, products like that. We were always looking for leading-edge technology that would enable parents. Uh, Early on, we found that a lot of that technology was a little bit too complicated or expensive for the average parent. So we sort of took two roads. We took the existing products we had, and we sold those to more advanced customers in the form of law enforcement in many cases. And we began work on coming up with simpler, easier-to-use products and um, learning how to deliver and support high-technology products to parents. And so for the last 10-plus years, that's what we've really been focused on, is delivering high-end products to parents in a way they can use them. So, Ty, you definitely talk about the high-end part of the equipment so one of my questions is like, you know, what separates like say if we look at a, a teddy bear nanny cam from Brick House and if somebody was to go on eBay they may see one being sold in China or someone sold somewhere else on some third market site. What separates your products from like, you know, your competition? So nowadays there are obviously a lot of websites like eBay and Amazon that profess to sell pretty much everything. And if you're looking to buy toilet paper or a charger for your phone, um, generally those are great places to get those products because they don't require any level of expertise or support to either select them or support them. Um, The challenge is when you're buying a product that you may have never used anything like that, um, you may need someone to help you pick the right product. And you might want to actually be able to talk to someone on the phone before and after to ensure not only you got the right product, but you know how to use it, and there's someone there to help you. Um, the difference between you know, buying a USB charger on Amazon or eBay, and if you say, oh, it didn't work, I don't need to know why it didn't work, I'm just going to return it, and that's all there is to it. 
Um, if you buy a nanny camera because you're concerned about the health and well-being of your child, returning it doesn't solve the problem. You need to actually learn how to use it and hopefully get one that works well. So let's talk about nanny cameras because they've become really popular. I know you've been on several national TV shows talking about the importance of getting a good nanny camera that works well. What are some of the reasons you're seeing parents calling Breakout Security in order to purchase a nanny cam? So it starts off with the most typical and obvious reason, which is two parents working have to leave their child in the care of some other person, generally a non-family member, um, while they go out to work and support the um, needs of the family. And that can be very difficult for a family to leave their child in the care of someone who they haven't known all that long. Uh, it can lead to them being distracted at work, having trouble, having sense of guilt, sense of fear, worry. Um, so the idea of the nanny camera is to provide a sense of well-being and a sense of assurance that your child is, in fact, being cared for well. Um, and if there is a problem, you would find out about it quickly and be able to address it, um, which allows you to more effectively focus on your work and providing the you know, needs of your family. Now, how are some of these nanny cams set up? Or is it set up where, if you know, is it set up through like a mobile app where I can call and, and view what's going on? Or is it a situation where I'm putting an SD card into the nanny cam and retrieving the video? Like once I get home, you know, is it live or is it a situation I'm just recording and watching at a later date? Nanny cams have come a long way in the last 12 years that we've been working with them. Uh, they've come from a point where you used to you'd have a camera connected by a wire to a recorder that was plugged in somewhere else um, to self-recording devices that have an SD card and a computer chip that controls it built right in. Um, and now you can actually get remote view cameras that you can view on an app from your phone. Um, some parents do want to be able to peek in live. Other parents are really more concerned about motion activated recording to allow them to sort of have an audit trail of what happened. So if the nanny says, yes, I took your child out from 11 a.m. until 2 p.m. to go out to the park, did they actually do that? Or were they sitting home watching soap operas? Uh, being able to see that door open and close and then going out and coming back and knowing that your child was dressed for the weather and taken care of and comes back at the same time just builds trust. You know what, Todd, that's an interesting point because I think, you know, people always talk about the safety aspect of nanny cameras, but not necessarily about the auditing purposes. So I'm wondering, are people calling you guys saying, look, my nanny is safe. I'm not worried about, you know, the well-being of my child, but I need to make sure that she's here doing what she's supposed to be doing, doing what's laid out in our contract, making sure that the kid is going out, coming back in at a certain time as a way to kind of verify that the work is being done before payment? So the most common reason people are getting a nanny camera isn't because they actually have a realistic fear that something is actually happening that will affect the safety of their child, because if they felt that, they wouldn't leave the home unattended at all. Uh, generally, it's a question of just peace of mind. They, they feel comfortable with the nanny, therefore they're leaving their child with the nanny, but without a little bit of verification, it's the little things that help build trust. Um, the, the nanny tells you they're taking the child out from 11 to 2. When you see on the camera that they actually did leave at 11 and come back at 2, that's just a sign of trust and sets a level of expectation. You say, okay, I can start to believe what they're saying. I don't want to just believe without verifying a little bit. So it really builds that trust between the nanny and the parents. So maybe they can turn off the camera at a later date once that trust is built. Yeah, and very often that's what we hear. We hear that the camera becomes very important in the first few months. And after that, it's sort of there, but they don't have to check the videotape all that often. They might check it once a month, whereas in the first few months they check it once a day. But after a while, it becomes something that's just in the background and if hypothetically something happened, a vase broke, 
something happened in the house, something went missing, they can always go and check and see what happened. But in the first few weeks and months, what we hear is those are really the, the times when parents are checking that video religiously every night to see what happened, how's my child going, getting along without me. And at a certain point, they realize their child's doing pretty well without them, and it's okay. And their child is eating and sleeping and sleeping and eating, and when they get home, they can play with their baby. <laughs> right. Now, have you seen any use uh, for, like, older kids, like, you know, teenagers or latchkey type kids, uh, you know, our parents, you know, purchasing nanny cams for that demographic? Absolutely. We're definitely seeing a lot of that. The same demographic shift that has led to the two-parent family working and not having someone home with the child, as soon as a child gets old enough that they can come home alone and they can be a latchkey kid and they can be responsible, parents pretty quickly do that. And it's not because these kids are necessarily more mature than we were when we were 12 years old. It's because there are economic realities. Both parents are working, and you can't really justify a nanny for a 12-year-old. A 12-year-old should really be able to come home and do their homework on their own. Uh, the question is, did they come into the house at 3 o'clock, or did they come into the house at 5.30? Did they come into the house alone, or did they come in with a bunch of buddies? Did they come in and immediately start doing their homework, or did they come in and start sitting on the couch watching TV or playing video games. Building trust with teenagers is a whole new process. Teenagers are constantly testing the boundaries. You know what, Todd? I think that's a good point, Todd, because I think now a lot of parents use like mobile apps. They use FaceTime or, or Skype if you're on Android or whatever to kind of do that face-to-face you know, mobile check-in once the kid gets into the door. But I guess once you, you know, once you log off or you hang up, you don't have any idea of what takes place in the house, you know, once you say goodbye. So maybe that nanny cam is that next step of, OK, we want to verify when I hung up with you off of FaceTime that you were actually doing your homework, that you were actually still at the house. You didn't go down the street to a neighbor's house or to a friend's house. Yeah, and, and a lot of the, the challenge that a lot of parents deal with is. The transparency that our parents had into our lives doesn't exist now. When I was growing up in the 70s and 80s, there was one phone in the house. It might have had a really long cord on it. Right, but very long cord. Much any room in the house, my parents could hear at least half the conversation I was having. So they knew who I was talking to, when I was making plans to go somewhere, um, I didn't have the ability to just start communicating and setting up plans with my friends on the, on the down low. Kids today can communicate. They can set things up. They are living much more independently at a much younger age. And it's not because they're more mature and it's not because they don't test boundaries the way we did. And parents still have to supervise their children and provide that adult parental supervision they just can't always do it from inside the house all the time. Right. And uh, one of the things I also see, you know, on your website, you guys have so many nanny cameras, uh, but you also have like, you know, do DIY or do it yourself cameras where you kind of build your own nanny camera based off of like a small box type camera that you guys sell online. Do you think it's easier for parents to like purchase, you know, a camera that already looks like an object such as an alarm clock, coat hook, or do you think it's better for them to kind of like build their own camera based off something they already have that's natural in their home? So over the years, we have built probably hundreds of different enclosures and different types of covert cameras, everything from air fresheners to lamps to tissue boxes to teddy bears to pretty much everything you can imagine and no matter how many we build there are always people who say why don't you make one that looks like x or out of all the hundred cameras you've got on your website i can't find one that would look good in my house because my decor is different um so what we did is we looked at it and we said you know what this is always going to be true there will always be people who want to have a camera that looks totally unique. 
we want to give them the ability to turn any household object in their house into a camera. And so we can take the core functionality, the camera, the battery pack, the computer chip that records it and tracks it all, the SD card, um, and put it all into an easy-to-use package. And we created a line of cameras called Camscura. And the idea of the Camscura line was you can take the camera and you can punch a hole in a tissue box or, you know, put it behind a book or something or just put it on a bookshelf and find your own way to hide it, find your own place to put it. It's a fully functioning hidden camera that can either work standalone or can be embedded into pretty much anything just by punching a hole in it. So how, what's the battery life on those cameras? Two days, one day, three days? So battery life is obviously the biggest challenge with a lot of what we do. Most of the cameras we work with are battery powered and mobile. And one of the big differentiators between our products and some of the ones that aren't quite professional level is that we have battery management units built in and computer chips to manage the battery life. So we're able to get out of some of ours months of battery life on standby. So if you set up a camera of ours in a closet that's going to be opened 10 times a day and record a one minute clip each time, it could literally last three months. Wow, that's a long time. Yes. And recharging batteries is something no one enjoys doing, so the less you have to do it, the better. So that probably separates Brickhouse products from other products that may seem similar on other sites, is that you guys are basically pimping out, you know, the nanny cams, like you're taking the insides out, putting your own uh, software, your own equipment inside is making it much more powerful. Yeah, we focus on products that have the same core components in them that we sell to law enforcement. So when we sell a product to law enforcement to be used in a, in a sting or a, a buy and bust, um, the core technology inside is the same technology we're using in our nanny cameras. Uh, we do one set of R&D, build the chips, work on the cameras, configure the software, um, and then there are very slight differences. For example, a camera that's designed for law enforcement can also record audio. Whereas a camera that's designed for consumers, the audio has been turned off. That's a good point. So if somebody has a nanny camera that's recording audio, then they can get into big trouble as far as like different eavesdropping laws, depending upon what state they live in, correct? Yes. Um, any device that is designed to covertly record audio conversations actually falls under a federal anti-wiretapping law. So even if your state allows single-party consent, which means one person in the house knows they're being recorded or one person being recorded knows about the recording, um, as soon as that person leaves the house and let's say the babysitter is there and their boyfriend walks in or they pick up the phone and call someone, you're now breaking a federal law and there are very steep consequences for that. Wow, that's good to know. We'll make sure we put, we label that law in the show notes so parents don't get in, themselves in trouble uh, if they're using nanny cams that record audio. Or better yet, just go to break house and you don't have to worry about that, right? Yeah, and we have a page on our website that explains the laws and how they apply because it's a very common question. Um, so I'd be happy to provide that link for you to put in your show notes. Uh, another thing, switching from nanny cams to GPS trackers, because you guys have been... Uh, creating GPS trackers, selling GPS trackers for years. With the new age cell phones and the smartphones that have GPS built in, is there an advantage for a parent to actually purchase a tracker to place in their child's car if they want to keep up, you know, what their kid's doing while they're driving? Or is it just as, it's just as good as using the cell phone to track the whereabouts? So there are apps you can put onto your child's cell phone. Um, Many parents don't want to give their kids a smartphone capable of running apps until they're probably in their mid to late teens. Um, having a 12-year-old in middle school or elementary school with a smartphone is you know, not really considered a great idea. They end up playing games and surfing the Internet. Uh, um, so very often they're either given a dumb phone or you know, no phone until a certain age. 
But even if you do have a smartphone, that smartphone, you may think you know more about it than your child, but you're most likely wrong. The kids know how to turn off apps. They know how to put it into a tinfoil bag. They know how to prevent it from working. Um, oh, I don't know why it wasn't picking up. It's not my not my problem. Right. Meanwhile, a little tinfoil bag they've been dropping their you know phone into every time they start speeding down the road or drive out of the uh, school during lunch to go go to McDonald's when they're supposed to be studying. So having a dedicated GPS tracker that your child may not know about in the car that they're driving is not a bad idea. Teenagers didn't magically become safer drivers in the last 20 years. Parents just started giving them the keys earlier because they're both working and they can't get them to soccer practice. So those kids are still driving the same way we did when we first got our licenses. And in many cases, they need to be supervised and sometimes reminded that speeding and, you know, harsh acceleration off the green light and harsh braking on the red light not only are unhealthy for the car, but they're dangerous. Then what type of products do you guys have um, that address those driving issues? So we provide GPS trackers that can just be plugged right into your vehicle, into the diagnostic port under the dashboard, or wired in with a simple two-wire installation at the fuse box. And that allows you to keep track of the car at all times, know where it is, how fast it's driving, get alerts when they're speeding, get alerts if they enter or exit a zone. One of the things a lot of parents like to do is create a geofence, which is sort of, you know, a little invisible line around the school and another one around the house. So they get an alert every time the child enters or exits the school and every time they enter or exit their home. Sometimes they'll even put a geofence around an area they don't want their child going to. Right. Maybe there's an area of town where the kids go to hang out and go to bars or do whatever it is they're doing in that neighborhood. You can put a geofence around that to get an alert and know instantly when they go there. We've had parents tell us that it's been incredibly powerful for them to be able to call up their child and say, hey, Johnny, um, I don't know if it's you or one of your friends driving a car just like yours, but one of our neighbors could have sworn they saw you driving around about an hour ago. That wasn't you, was it? You're still at school, right? So it starts to you know, let kids know that parents have eyes everywhere. They don't need to know about the GPS, but they get an idea that they're not completely unsupervised. And what have you seen in regards to like insurance benefits? I know there's a lot of insurance companies. If you hardwire that GPS unit into your child's car, you can get a pretty significant insurance break. You, you, and we all know that teenagers, especially insurance premiums, premiums are crazy and super expensive. Have you heard or have parents told you guys that they're they're getting pretty significant insurance breaks when they hardwire these devices into their car? So when you hardwire a GPS tracker into your vehicle, you can get what's called the um, theft recovery deduction, which is um, usually a 10 to 20 percent deduction, depending on your insurance for having a quote unquote theft recovery device. It's the same deduction you would get by putting LoJack in. The difference is it's a lot less expensive than LoJack and you can check on its whereabouts yourself independently. Um, Unfortunately, insurance companies do still charge an exorbitant rate the moment you put a teenager onto your insurance. Right. And they do that not because they're mean, not because they're trying to take advantage of you, but because statistically, teenagers get into a lot more accidents. And that's why teenagers need a little more supervision and just trusting your kid to not speed and not drive unsafely without actually watching and coaching and giving them advice is probably not the best best way to go about it. Yeah, I know some parents taught to use the GPS as a teaching tool. I think you kind of mentioned that a couple of questions ago uh, in regards to how they can tell if the kid's braking really fast, the speed, how fast they're, you know, how fast they're going, how many stops they're making. You know, have you seen people use it as a teaching tool to, to kind of like gauge their driving ability, you know, when they first put it in, say, okay, we need to have a conversation about how fast you're going, how many times you're slamming on brakes, how many times you're accelerating. 
Yeah, we have some parents that go so far as to show the kids the web-based system and say, listen, I can see when you're speeding. I can see how, how you're braking. I see what's going on. Um, and other parents don't want to let on that they're keeping an eye on the kid because they're afraid if the kid knows that the car is being tracked, they'll just get into their friend's car and God knows how well their friend drives. Right. So better to have them in a car that you know about. Um, so very often we will have parents tell us that they you know, sort of play the game of, okay, we're watching our child drive. We see him going five miles over the speed limit. We're not going to yell at him for it. We see him doing 90 miles an hour. We're going to yell at him for it. And that makes perfect sense. You know, it wants, you can jump in real quick before an accident happens or God knows a super expensive speed ticket hits the front door. Safety is the key concern. Um, you know, teenagers do die in car accidents far more often than we would like to hear about. And uh, they get into car accidents where it's not just themselves, it's their friends and innocent bystanders. So, you know, making sure they learn how to be responsible drivers requires someone supervising them, whether you're in the car with them the first couple times they're driving or you're remotely keeping an eye on them when they think they're alone and ensuring that they actually have learned their lessons and drive safely. Now, to switch subjects, Todd, one of the questions, you know, we get a lot here at Digital Parent is, you know, uh, parents who got kids who are being bullied uh, in the classroom, either by other peers or by school teachers. Is there a product for those parents to kind of covertly determine whether or not bullying is taking place at school so they can address it with the school administration? Yeah, school bullying has, you know, some of it has really moved to cyberbullying. Right. But the reality is that there is still a lot of the traditional bullying going on in schools. And in many cases, it's still more hurtful to the kids because it is in real life. It's not just cyberbullying, although cyberbullying can be very serious as well. Um, people do sometimes overlook the real old fashioned bullying that goes on and has gotten in some cases, much more severe than what we're used to or what we might remember. Um, Not just among kids that can advocate for themselves and are capable of saying someone's bullying, but also among kids who either may not be comfortable advocating for themselves or may not be capable of it. In the case of kids with autism and other special needs, Down syndrome, things like that, There are a lot of children who just aren't capable of verbally expressing what's happening and telling their parents about it. Um, And then you have other kids that are just shy and don't want to bring up the issue or feel guilty about it, feel like it's their fault for some reason. So we do have a lot of parents that are interested in sort of understanding what's going on with their kids. It does fall into two general categories. One is where Your child is telling you something's happening. Either a teacher or another student or another person in authority is acting inappropriately, in which case they want to capture the evidence to avoid the he said, he said, she said argument. Um, And we do have kids that are sent to school with digital cameras that are in the form of a pen or a keychain and or glasses or a hat or a book bag. And they will actually record what's going on and then come back and say, here, I've got the evidence. This child, this teacher, or this other person in authority is acting inappropriately. And then you can go to the right people and talk about it. Um, Unfortunately, going to the school administration or the police without evidence really doesn't lead to much activity. They can't do much about it. So the other case... The other case is kids who can't advocate for themselves, and that's the more challenging one. And we have had kids that um, their parents have sent them to school with a book bag and recorded the entire day at school from that book bag and then found out that their child was being verbally abused by a teacher, even though the child couldn't say a word about it. That's interesting. So was that one of your uh, cameras that, you know, you had to do do it yourself cameras that they were putting in the book bags? Because I'm assuming they would have to put like a pinhole or something through the book bag so that the lens could record what was taking place in the classroom. 
Um, we actually have a pinhole camera that was designed just for that. It's built into a book bag already. Um, but um, we also find that, you know, we have a pen camera. We have, you know, a baseball cap camera. We've got a glasses camera. We've got a couple of different cameras that work like that. Um, and in many cases, it's really just the audio they need to capture. Um, you just have to make sure you're in a state that allows for single party consent where the child knows that they're being recorded. So it's the audio that's being recorded, not necessarily the video. Yeah, in many cases, it's audio. Okay, got it. That makes sense. Now, I know that you guys have started to do some prototyping of body cameras due to a lot of things that are happening in the streets, uh, you know, with law enforcement shooting people down left and right uh, for the protection of the victims and also for the protection of the law enforcement. Can you kind of talk about some of the body cameras that you guys currently sell and some of the ones that you're creating? Yeah, we've been selling body worn cameras for many years, um, for years before the word body camera was ever mentioned in the news. Um, primarily they were used in, um, buy and bust operations where law enforcement would send a teenager in to buy alcohol or tobacco, um, and then catch people who aren't carding and are letting that happen. So a lot of this, a lot of the technology we built around wearable cameras was really around the hat, the glasses, the keychain, the pen, the body worn covert cameras. Um, but as we've started to see, um, concerns with uniformed officers and non-uniformed officers, we're definitely seeing a lot more demand for cameras um, across the spectrum from both police officers that want to make sure that they are, you know, able to show what they did or didn't do themselves and people who are worried about being pulled over inappropriately or interacting with law enforcement in a way that may not be professional and they want to be able to prove that. So, you know, say that, I'm just sitting here thinking, do you have cameras for like, you know, the car? So if, you know, if I'm pulled over by the police officer, I can start recording once the officer war, you know, walks up to my car and, and feels safe? Yeah, we've got a couple of cameras that people use for that. Um, the keychain camera is very popular. Um, just taking your keys and putting them on your dashboard um, is a good way to, you know, show a police officer that you are being cooperative but it also puts your camera in the perfect spot by having that keychain right there pointed at them. So the keychain camera has been very popular for that, especially among drivers who are concerned they get pulled over inappropriately. Um, we also have, you know, other cameras. We have a, a smiley face camera. People literally pin to their visor um, right on the windshield, and it works great. You just hit the button, and it starts recording. That's excellent. Any other uh, products, Todd, that you think you know our parents, our consumers need to be aware of that you guys are working on right now that could be helpful? Um, I think it's not always about the product. It's about the concern. And that's, that's one of the reasons why we differentiate ourselves by having a hotline parents can call to speak to a real person. Uh, because one of the things we find is when people try to diagnose their problem and prescribe the solution independently – they do so based on the information that they have, which might be from the last James Bond movie they saw. <laughs> and it might not necessarily reflect how today's technology really works. So we want people to call us, um, which is a big difference between us and an Amazon or an eBay. Um, we have a phone number at the top of our website. We want people to call. We take the time to listen to them, understand their needs. If someone calls us up and they say, hey, I need a GPS tracker for my kid, we're going to ask them, how old is your child? What are your concerns? And if they come back and say, oh, my child is one year old, we're going to say, okay, unless you're in a child custody battle, GPS is not what we would recommend. We have a non-GPS child locator that is $29 as opposed to $129 and has no monthly fee. We'd be happy to sell you something less expensive if it's the right solution for you. Because quite honestly, GPS on a one-year-old is not a great idea right? if it's not a custody issue or something like that. Because if they get far enough away from you that you need GPS to find them, you've already failed. You need to have something that's going to alert you when they're more than 10 feet away, not a mile away. 
So, Todd, the last question, where can parents find the most information about Breakout Security? Is it a website? Is it your YouTube page? Is it Twitter? I would say our website is probably the best place to start, BreakoutSecurity.com. Everything is linked from there, whether it's our YouTube, our Facebook, um, you know, other things that we do in the media. We're happy to talk, but definitely start at the website and feel free to call. We have people waiting to talk and uh, understand what your needs are and help you find the right solution. And if if the solution is something that you already have, then we're happy to tell you that as well. And do you have demo videos on your website that demonstrate the products in use? We do. Almost every product on the website has a video of how it works as well as sample video if it is a camera. Oh, that's awesome. Well, hey, Todd, thanks a lot for being on the show. We learned a lot about security today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Hey, Pierce, I hope you really enjoyed the episode with Todd. And please go to the show notes for this podcast. We have all the links for Breakhouse Security. Just like Todd said, when you go through those links and you click on when you go to the Breakhouse website, make sure you call their toll-free number so you can talk with one of their outstanding consultants to get the surveillance equipment that you feel that you need for your family. And as always, make sure you go to iTunes and rate the Digital Parent Podcast and let us know what you thought about this show with Todd. Until the next time.